Hello, this is Greg Allison Green Greg. It's coming to you on the 27th of January, 22. Time on deck, 1909, hours Central Standard Time. My friends, I got a special guest tonight, uh, David Pine. He is the Deputy Director of Operations of the EMP Task Force on National and Homeland Security. That's a mouthful. I'm supposed to be the State Director, and it's still a mouthful for Alabama. <laughs> so tonight we're going to be talking to you about what uh joe biden and his administration ought to do to try to promote peace in this upcoming uh conflagration that we might get into with russia if we're not careful over uh, all the goings on in europe especially ukraine but it's bigger than just ukraine because uh the, the uh russians are putting a lot of demands out there uh, against nato a lot of which uh, nato is not willing to sign up to but uh, and uh, they, they are expressing the satisfaction with uh, the answers we're giving them so far. But I've seen a glimmer of hope. I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is part of my eyes wide open head on a swivel news series, guys, because it's getting real. We're with the tensions in the world right now are off the charts with the Ukraine, with, with also China. There's a lot of stuff going on in China and the South China Sea right now that you're not even hearing about because we got so much focus in the news on Ukraine. The Russians have got us so got our eyeballs peeled so wide open that we can't hardly hear or listen to anything else but there's a lot going on in the world right now the risk are unprecedented since maybe the cuban missile crisis in 1962 and all my time i can't I think of anything as tense as this this is why you need to get ready this is why you need to prepare if you're not subscribed to my channel do so now bang the up notification bell and click all so you can get more of my videos i'm trying to bring you stuff about what the potentialities are and also, we try to come up with things that we might do to keep these things from happening. It's not all fear mongering, as some people think when you start talking about topics like this, because that's what this video is about. It's about what can we do to throw a little water on this hot situation if we have the opportunity. Let's hope and pray we can do that. But right now, all the bets are off because it seems that some people uh, are really kind of heck bent on us going down a road that we ought not go down. It would take us to more fire and intensity you might want to see. I just did an interview last night with uh, General Kenneth Krosniak, and I posted it this morning, and, you know, he, he's talking about, you know, how the, our military is not prepared for the kind of high-intensity combat we might see, even if it does not go nuclear, and that we're, we're, that this is going to be a huge challenge to us, and how it's in the doctrine of these uh, other countries like Russia, China, North Korea, to actually EMP America if they get into conflict with them. That's, not the first, that's actually written in their military doctrine. We can supply the documents if you need to see them, that that's the top priority if they get into it with us. So that is bad news here on the home front, my friends. I've done so many videos on that. If you don't understand that, go back and look at those videos too. And, then, uh, and I also do videos on things that you can do to prepare yourself, including you need to grow a garden. You can check out my links to True Leaf Market for your good seed supplies on that. And you need to, uh, hey, you can eat free from the weeds and trees. I've got videos on that. I'll be doing bushcraft videos and look at the videos I did with Stacy Zavicki recently, giving a lot of good tips for uh, prepping uh, in a situation like this, what to do in the first 24 and the next 24 hours, first 48 hours between two videos. If we get into a grid down or nuclear event, I've got videos on nuclear bug out, on just general bug out, uh, how to survive a nuclear winter. So we're trying to cover these topics because they may get real on us real fast. But this video is going to be about seeing if we can stop that. But in the meantime, my friends, right now, you need to consider our supply chain shattering around the world as they are in any conflict is going to make it far worse. And with the potentiality of a grid down, whether it be from this or the sun. And if we survive all this, the sun might take us out, my friends. So you need to prepare every way you can right now to get ready. And right now we got a really good special given the inflation coming up right now. We get, we, we've gone back to the $150 off special for a three months supply of food. It's got 2000 calories a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It'll keep hungry away, hunger away and make you a winner with that because a lot of the other competitors are talking 800 calories a day or they're short on supplies given all the issues in the supply chain. Now with inflation, this is great guys, check it out. And if you can't afford a three month supply, there's a, they've reintroduced the $50 off. So to get that special, go to printwithgreg.com, printwithgreg.com and at printwithgreg.com, you can find also all kinds of other prepping supplies. Just click on the My Patient Supply logo at the top and it'll take you into a whole smorgasbord of things. And nobody else out there at all has the variety of long-term storage food. 
it is the second to none. So do check that out. All right, my friends. Uh, David Pry, uh, excuse me, <laughs> David Pine. Uh, yeah, we've had Peter Pry on late, lately, and he is a director, by the way, executive director of the EMP Task Force on National Homeland Security. I've had him on several times too. Uh, but uh, David Pine has written an article recently in the National Interest. It's a great magazine. They've got an online version and they cover uh, defense issues. Uh, in his article, it was about what should Biden do to, to throw a little cold water on this, to hope, have some hope for peace. Uh, maybe you should start out uh, with, if, if we keep going this way, what do you think is gonna happen that's gonna be bad? How, how do you think we'd actually get into war with Russia if, we're, if we don't put troops in Ukraine like Biden suggests, although we got NATO, we got troops under NATO command right now. So I'm not sure what's going down in that area. What, what do you think, uh, David? What's, well, how do you see us getting into Russia? Before I jump to my recommendations, let me just give your listeners a little background. Uh, I know I, I did so on, on the last time I was on your show a few weeks ago. Uh, but this, this kind of started, you know, the, the issues with Ukraine began with the expansion of NATO. Um, George Kennan wisely warned in 1997 when the decision was made to expand NATO eastward to include former Warsaw Pact countries that this would lead to conflict with Russia and it wouldn't turn out well. Um, for us in terms of uh, increased threat from Russia of war. Um, and that, that uh, certainly proved, proved to be the case. Uh, you know, we had a, we've had multiple expansions of NATO eastward to include not only virtually the entire Warsaw Pact, but also uh, three former Soviet republics in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And uh, needless to say, Russia hasn't been very happy about that. They view um, the Baltics um, as part of their severe, severe influence, not just Ukraine and Belarus, um, as, as well as, uh, well, they'd like to have a sphere of influence uh, over um, the former Warsaw Pact countries, or at least have them be kind of a neutral buffer state where uh, no foreign, um, you know, NATO, Western NATO or, or US military forces can go. And so uh, what uh, Putin has done is he's, um, He's offered us, uh, I think it was uh, late last month, he uh, proposed a security agreement um, to kind of restructure the, the security architecture of Europe. And a lot of people kind of have never heard of some of the ideas that he's proposed, but uh, this is actually the third time that he's made this proposal. I think the first time was in 2007. And basically there, there are six different parts of it, but maybe just a few that, that are important. Uh, number one is that uh, the US and NATO will agree to never, not to expand NATO um, into additional former Soviet republics. That would include Ukraine, Georgia, obviously Belarus is a Russian ally. So uh, that's kind of a non-issue. Um, and then also to withdraw um, all US and Western NATO troops from Eastern Europe. Currently there's uh, 5,000 U.S. troops uh, deployed in Poland and Romania, and then there are uh, 4,000 NATO troops, Western NATO troops, deployed in the Baltic states and Poland. And so we're talking about 9,000 troops. These troops, by the way, uh, did not enter Eastern Europe until 2016. So basically all he's asking for is a return to the pre-2016 status quo, which is no Western troops in Eastern Europe. Uh, so that should be acceptable. Um, the, in terms of you, um, you know, us providing them a written guarantee that Ukraine will not be part of NATO, um, that's really been a settled issue. That's the, the irony is that's been a settled issue. It's something that uh, Biden administration refuses to concede, but France and Germany opposed Bush's proposal back in 2008 to add Ukraine and Georgia to NATO. And Obama supported that as well, but he wasn't able to persuade France and Germany wisely uh, realize that that would, um, would enrage Russia and could cause a potential conflict in war. Um, so, and then um, another part of the treaty is, uh, you know, Russia is seeking to have us withdraw our, all of our 150 uh, gravity bombs, nuclear gravity bombs um, from about five countries in, in Western Europe. Um, those, you know, those nuclear bombs are uh, very dated. You know, they're probably in the in the order of uh, half a century old. Uh, they could 
they could be destroyed uh, fairly quickly. Uh, our, the planes that would carry them aren't on alert status. They're not on strip alert. Let's, 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 let's take a point on that right there. We got what, about 350 of these uh, aircraft buried gravity bombs in Europe right now total. It's, that's, that's so the, numbers, uh, the numbers have varied, but uh, the most reliable number I've heard is 150. Russia's accused us of having up to 200. Okay, okay. So I was on the upper side of it. But this yeah. is nowhere near what we had in the Cold War. We're, we're way down. We don't have Persian missiles there. We don't have some of the weapon system, type weapon systems he's telling us not to deploy. They're not even there. We don't have short-range ballistic missiles right. that, are, that are offensive. A lot of people get confused. They're listening to this and they go, well, Pedro, he shouldn't have to deal with those kind of, well, it's not there. We don't have those kind of systems. And the Aegis system is a defensive system. Uh, it's not even capable of carrying these kind of weapon systems. It's built differently. Uh, so, and I could understand this. Okay, if you don't want it, an Aegis system in Poland, we could back it off a little bit. Uh, but those aren't going, to, those by themselves are not going to invalidate a mad mutual assured destruction uh, scenario because there's just not enough of them to counter the Soviet, or excuse me, the Russian. I still talk Soviet until I'm old school. I was in, a, I was a, uh, I was quite the cold warrior once upon a time when I was in the service. <laughs> so I still call them the Soviet Union occasionally by accident. But, sure. uh, um, and they're certainly beginning to act a little bit like it. Uh, but we, we don't have those, the kind of stuff we had there then. We, uh, we put the Persian missiles in there and we got Russia to, to agree to new treaties to back their stuff off. Interestingly, Russia is putting an Iskalander uh, 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 short-range ballistic missile system in Belarus right now. So they're actually doing what they're telling us not to do. And I yeah. think they've got the capacity to hit Kiev. So that's a little hypocritical on their side. Uh, I'm not sure that we want to take everything out of Europe, uh, David. I might take counterpoint with that just on the basis that uh, that's been our ace in the hole that's kept the Russians from rolling in the past because they've outnumbered us in conventional forces for a long time. And uh, it was the notion that we might hit them with something like that that, that kept them from rolling on, especially during the uh, Soviet Union days when their goal, the goal of communism was world domination. Uh, that's not the case in Russia today. They don't have the same motives that they used to have. So uh, the, the fact that we're facing each other in a, in a semen crisis uh, as bad as the Cuban Missile Crisis is kind of mind boggling. And it's, it's, and it's over a lot of nuances. I do think that we can do a lot of negotiation, but I don't think we should give, I personally don't think we should give that part away because that those bombers and fighter aircraft just don't have the same capacities as say a short range ballistic missile, short range ballistic missiles like the Persians we had there and things like that. And now that's up for discussion. Uh, I certainly wouldn't lay all the chips on the table to start with, uh, but uh, there, there's a lot of things I think we can negotiate. And there is a glimmer of hope. I've just heard that Russia was actually kind of pleased having had some uh, negotiations with Ukraine over the U Ukraine's uh, notion that they would allow uh, separatists from the separatist regions to actually run for office in uh, Ukraine. Uh, that seemed to appease Russia quite a bit. And they're supposed to come back for further negotiations in two weeks. So I think there's a glimmer of hope right there and just negotiations between the Ukrainians and the Russians directly. What do you think? Um, I think there is a limited amount of hope. I wouldn't say a lot. Um, I didn't say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Biden administration is, is, um, did, has not played its cards well. They're, they play, as I state in my article, they're playing a dangerous game that's uh, flirting with uh, potential uh, EMP, cyber, or even nuclear war with Russia, unnecess you know, unnecessarily. I mean, Russia certainly does pose a, a huge threat to us, but if we were to establish more friendly relations with them and come to an agreement with them where, whereby they would recognize you know, Western Europe as uh, kind of a permanent U.S. sphere of influence, and we would uh, recognize the former Soviet Union as their sphere of influence, you know, with kind of Eastern Europe remaining part of NATO, but uh, being outside of, of our either one of our spheres of influence. Um, I think that would go a long way to establish uh, peace and understanding between us, as well as signing a friendship treaty with them. You know, Peter and I have, have uh, been pushing this for a couple of years now, um, mm -hmm. and uh, what, what we think would be in the best interest of, of the United States our, in terms of our national security would be to um, come to a strategic partnership with Russia, maybe not 
not a full alliance necessarily, but a strategic partnership. I call it a, a grand strategic partnership for peace. Uh, Peter's idea is, is kind of to uh, use that as a counterpoint to China. And I certainly, I don't think he, he uh, wants to see, you know, war with China. Or he, he's really thinking that. I think um, our, our idea is uh, to, we would, that would deter China from attacking us because it, right now with their alliance with, uh, with Russia, you know, it's going to be a two on one, you know, two nuclear su superpowers to one. Um, but in a one-on-one -on -one fight, you know, where, where Russia didn't have their back, they might be a little more reluctant uh, to uh, stage a, an attack on us. Well, I think you've just brought up several points that are worth dissecting there. Uh, uh, this whole notion that uh, the latter point being that uh, we have a peace treaty, this is something I've called for uh, two years back in some of my videos. In that, uh, the, in the long term, Russia's biggest threat is of us, is China, and the same goes for us. And the fact, and we have pushed Russia into China's corner, and a lot of it's got to do with the current administration and their past iterations, uh, and, and the pressure they put on Russia that have got got them in that position. And I agree with you that Biden is not playing this well, in my opinion, because see, to, go, to make another point. Uh, you know, I think he's trying to, to look strong for a change after his bumbling he did with Afghanistan and some other things. His polls have dropped. His party is worried about uh, having anything in the government uh, in the midterm, losing the House and the Senate and, and maybe the presidency, too, and maybe having a hard time coming. They're, 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 right now, the polls are like they're going to take huge losses. And so he's trying to find a way back politically. So I think he's playing risk with the entire planet over uh, party politics, possibly. It's called Wag the Dog, and that was kind of the topic of the video that I had with the theme of the video that I just did with uh, General Krasniak. Uh, right. that, that we're playing a, a dangerous political game here, and I think we've been doing that and all these accusations against Russia that we have room to make peace. Russia is a lot more like us than, than not, especially than China, what a lot of people are us. They're not communist anymore. They may have a lot of people that would like to return to communism. What they're trying to do is rebuild the Russian empire with, with a different form of government. Uh, it is, a, you know, on the surface, they elect people, but we know that Putin is really uh, more or less a dictator, but he is one that could be through an elective process to suppose that the people of Russia were uh, got enough opposition against him. So, but he does play heavy handed. He doesn't play, you know, he plays dirty. You know, there's uh, people that have been poisoned and things that have happened that uh, call a lot of things into question. So uh, he's not to be taken lightly. Uh, I don't view him as a saint or, uh, you, know, there's, you know, a lot of people in America think that he's a saint or they think that he's a devil. I, I'd say he's a, he's a political animal and we have to treat him as such. You have to understand he's a political animal. So is the, our president and so is Xi Jinping, all these guys that rise that level as political animals. But maybe we can help enlighten if we get the right word in the right place guys like Biden to uh, take some steps back and, and not push us into the brink. Because right now, I think uh, Biden is uh, maybe more push us in that direction than the Ukrainians, uh, since the Ukrainians aren't talking with Russia now and about things that maybe our side is not really towing the water for. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And, and I wanted to say that, um, you know, under no terms am I, am I saying we should accept the Russians, you know, Russia's security agreement without any concessions on their part. Quite the contrary. I would argue that we should, um, we should accept it, every single one of their conditions based on reciprocal conditions on their end. So if we, you know, if we pull our troops back, they have to withdraw their troops from Ukraine. They need to, you know, honor the uh, CFE treaty, Con Conventional Forces in Europe treaty. Uh, limitations on how many troops and, and tanks and whatnot they can have um, in Europe. Um, in terms of uh, nuclear weapons, if we were to withdraw our nuclear weapons, which are, you know, as I said, outdated and uh, would like could be destroyed with five SS-26 short-range ballistic missiles or, you know, any other Russian nuclear weapons, um, then uh, they would have to denuclearize Kaliningrad, uh, pull out um, and pull all of their nuclear weapons back to Russian territory. Uh, not in Belarus, not in Cuba or Venezuela has been, as they've been threatened. Well, I mean, if we do that, if we were to make an agreement like that, they'd have to go further with bringing down their conventional forces. 
because our nuclear weapons have been the ace in the hole we've used in the past because of the, there was an asymmetry. The Russian forces were superior numerically in conventional uh, uh, weapon systems and troops. They, they, they've got to be on par if we're going to make an agreement like that. And that should be understood. And right. you know, it shouldn't be where nobody's got an upper hand to, to, to uh, advance on anybody else. I mean, NATO is really a defensive uh, treaty organization that's not set up to invade. And I, I, I take it the Russia is, is proceeding from a paranoia based on the history of Napoleon and, and uh, Hitler having invaded Russia in the past, and they, they lost a lot of lives. And I've been to, I've been in the Duma, and I've been to a opera in the Duma in which they celebrated the, their defeat of the Germans. Uh, and that's a big thing in Russia that caused, uh, uh, they had to fight that war very, that was a very tough war. It was, and it's still very, very ingrained into the memory of the Russian people. Just kind of like people in the South, it's taken people in the South a hundred years to almost get over the war of Northern aggression, as I would call it. <laughs> Some people are gonna pick on me for that, but you know, I gotta, I gotta jab back a little bit, but, uh, the situation in uh, Russia is that they, you know, they burn their own buildings to, to, and, and, and crops just to, to starve out the advancing uh, enemies. And it was a brutal, brutal war. And it's, you know, there's still people alive, not so many, but there's still people alive that were in that. And, and they really, really think about that a lot. But I think it's more than that. I think where we messed up perhaps was uh, there was the color revolution in which, you know, see, we, we meddle in other people in other countries' politics all the time. And we, we, we want to slap their hands when they do it, but we do it too. And it did happen in Ukraine. We, we seem to have been involved in the, the uh, coup that replaced the uh, Ukrainian president who was leaning pro-Russian. And that's part of what Putin is remembering and seeing. And he's wondering if he would be next in the next color revolution because there are opposition forces in Russia. And so I, you know, I think, you know, what a, anybody in power like that, their main goal is to stay in power. And I've said it many times, that's their main goal is to maintain that power. And if that, they feel that's threatened, they'll, they'll sacrifice their own country to keep that power going. That's true of uh, uh, Kim in uh, North Korea, it's, it's uh, true of Xi, Xi Jinping in China and Putin. So we have to marry. If you don't want the nukes to fly, don't make them think that you're going to take him out in Moscow. You got to keep it on the battlefield uh, if you get into conflict with them. But you know, who knows? Things can escalate. There's such uh, you get into conflict. You know, all, all bets are off. Escalation happens, and anything can happen. You know, the best plans go out the window when the war starts, and you have all kind of plans, but they just don't make it. Now you yourself, and we, we need to talk to your credentials a little bit because some of the people here aren't familiar. You've been quite involved in the European theater through the Department of Defense. Tell us a little bit about your background in that area. Yeah, you bet. So I'm a former U.S. Army officer, uh, armor officer, uh, combat arms. <clears throat> and I also uh, served as a U.S. Army headquarters staff officer in charge of um, all uh, U.S. Army R&D cooperation with the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and various other uh, areas of the world. And so I, I did travel as part of uh, DOD uh, uh, delegations as you know the um, typically the the principal army representative but sometimes my my boss was a full bird colonel would travel with me um, to uh, negotiate these international agreements um, so I have something of a background in international diplomacy um, I also uh, study um, I'm a big student of military history and I write alternate military history articles uh, I've written several uh, actually in the national interest about World War II as well as uh, some on real clear history um, about World War II and other conflicts. Um, and you know what, where certain decisions could have uh, prevented world wars altogether. And the one thing I've, I've found about all, both world wars is that it was great power alliances that uh, transformed regional conflicts into unnecessary world wars that uh, very few, few people wanted. I mean, France, certainly wanted World War I because they wanted Alsace-Lorraine back. That was kind of a fatal mistake that Germany did and by overreaching the Franco-Prussian War to take Alsace-Lorraine and get uh, all this French en uh, enmity. Um, it, but uh, other than that, you know, there weren't a lot of people that wanted World War I. World War II was just Stalin. I mean, Stalin wanted 
you know, Hitler and the, the Western European powers to destroy each other. So the Red Army would, would come rolling in. Hitler didn't want war with uh, France or, or England or, or Poland. He wanted Poland and Britain as, as, a, as an ally against uh, the Soviet Union. So that war would have just been restri you know, restricted more likely to, to Germany and, and the Soviet Union. We would have had two, or, two of our enemies kill each other off. Um, you know, so obviously I'm not advocating China and Russia kill each other off. Uh, but I, I, I do think it'd be much, much healthier if we had kind of a balance of power. You know, we have these, these uh, realist foreign policy concepts, um, you know, grand strategies that would reestablish uh, a balance of power, spheres of influence, uh, things that have maintained the peace uh, for, for many, you know, decades, if not a century, you know, um, in, in our recent modern history. Um, you know, these kind of ideas are, are considered radioactive, I guess, according to, you know, the Biden administration. They don't want to consider a sphere of influence, but whether they, they are willing to admit it or not, the United States has a sphere of influence over the Western Hemisphere, and I would argue uh, Western Europe and, and Japan as well, and that we, we should have that inf uh, sphere of influence. Uh, Russia also has a sphere of influence, uh, certainly over the former Soviet Union. Um, China obviously has their sphere of influence. Uh, over a number of areas in uh, East, East Asia, Central Asia, or rather South Asia, and, as well as Southeast Asia. So um, I think it'd be wise if we were to, you know, again, we're refusing to, to admit the facts as they exist in the world today. So we need to, uh, to reestablish a, a, a trilateral international order that recognizes the vital interests of, of all three uh, superpowers and serves to try to you know, deconflict and prevent war between, uh, between us uh, that could lead to a, a nuclear EMP conflict that could um, end up in the destruction of our country and the loss of tens of millions of American lives. Well, I think also though, though to do that, we do need to take some Western values into that and that I do believe that people have the right of self-determination uh, that, that if uh, people don't want to be part of some other people, and I've said this all the time on my channel, they shouldn't have to be. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we've got to go in there with our tanks and weapon systems, but we ought to try to negotiate treaties that allow Ukraine to main, remain Ukraine. But part of that might be that Ukraine's got to give up something too, because they are yeah. also trying to hold uh, people that don't want to be part of them. If they don't want to be part of somebody else, they should recognize that they should hold people that don't want to be part of them. And I'm talking about the people of Donbass. Now, some people, I, I got some friends who would, who would argue about that. Say, well, Donbass is taking over. That, that's not true. Well, let them vote. Let them vote. And just make sure it's a fair election. Same goes for Crimea. I do not, under any circumstance, foresee any way that Russia would give up Crimea shy of a nuclear war. I think it's just too right. vital to them. I, and Crimea was Russian prior to the Soviet Union, where they gave it to Ukraine as part of the what they brought them in, they just thought it made more sense for them to administer it. Uh, but, you know, the Ukrainians have a lot of beef, rightful beef against Russia because, when the, you know, uh, Russia went in there in, in the Soviet days and uh, in the breadbasket for Europe, people were starving because the Russians were taking everything. So there's a lot of legitimate beefs on both sides. And I can understand why a lot of people would not want to be part of the, the Russian system in Ukraine. So we, we've got to find some way to make it, to make it work, but I think if uh, you know with the tit for tat, if the Russians know that Donbass and uh, is going to at least remain autonomous, truly autonomous, without being picked on by Ukraine, and uh, Crimea can still be in their uh, their pocket, and maybe maybe there's something should be conceded so they got a little bit of a land bridge there so they can get water resources into Crimea. That's one of their big contentions. Uh, then. We might could deconflict this thing, and and, and when going with that, yeah, we're not going to try to take Ukraine into NATO, which we're not anyway. Uh, we're, we're we're talking about a conflict over a right of a country to enter a treaty organization that the treaty organization doesn't necessarily want to have in it in the first place. And if yeah, this sure. is the basis of World War Three, that's nuts. It's crazy. So yeah. let, well, let's find some ways to deconflict this. Uh, you know, but but I, I I don't see that coming out of the Biden administration. That's what worries me. I see. Maybe the Ukrainians would be more in, interested in making that kind of a, uh, a treaty than, than our own administration, but Biden and, uh, seems to be elsewhere on that. So maybe this is where people that follow me could uh, uh, go to the uh, Freedom Restoration Action Center 
go to freedomrestoration.org and click on action center and see how to write people in and contact the white house on that i'm not sure i got the white house contact but i got tons of congressional contacts in there how to find congressmen but it's you know 1600 pennsylvania avenue guys <laughs> you, can, you can reach the white house without a lot of trouble uh at least in, and you look them up go to whitehouse.gov uh the white house is hard to find in terms of communicating with them don't mean you can get in there personally but you know I wouldn't try that unless you had an invitation. <laughs> but some people try; they can get in trouble. You don't want to go there. Uh, we're, we're here. We're trying to promote peace. You know, I've I've been to Moscow, and I, I love the city. I love the city there. I love the people there. You know, I, I walk around in Moscow, and I looked at these people back in twenty March of twenty ten when I was there. I thought, why in the world would we want to nuke these people? And then, then why would they want to nuke us? We're, we're not that different. In fact, we're not that different from anybody in the world, to be honest, person to person. Everybody's the same inside. We all you know, laugh and cry and, and nod for yes and shake their head for no. And we really want the same kind of things. You know, we want a chance to, to succeed in the world and uh, to have a chance for our families and our kids to grow up in a, in a better society and have hope for their future. Everybody wants that. But that don't come through warfare. But nations, for their power games, play us against each other and they use that. And so and a lot of politics get into this, whether it be from Putin or Biden or, or whoever. So uh, I need to do a video on Putin, on, on him and his psychology in the future. I might do that. But what do you say to that? So, I mean, you mentioned that uh, paranoia is kind of um, the key determinant of Russian behavior right now. I actually uh, don't believe that's the case. I think um, the Russians they have a lot, I mean, they have the, some of the best intelligence in the world. They, they know that um, the US and NATO don't really pose a threat to them. They know that Ukraine is, you know, as, as uh, Biden reportedly told uh, the president of Ukraine, uh, point blank, uh, mem NATO membership is not in the cards for Ukraine. Um, so a lot of this is just pretext, but what it ultimately, you know, pretext for war, ultimately what it is, I think is, um, it's you know part of uh, Putin's bid to to restore Russia uh, to great power status. Now, obviously, it's a great power; it's the greatest nuclear superpower in the world. But it's not doesn't receive the international recognition and prestige for the great superpower that it is. And um, this is kind of, you know part of his bid to to try to try to get that. Um, but it's really part of his you know part of his design, which is to restore. Russian domination and control over the former Soviet Union and ideally Eastern Europe as well. And so that's really the, ba the basis is it's, it is more of a power grab, but- I agree uh, that's part of it. It may also be a land grab. Some people think that he really wants Ukraine for its breadbasket aspects. That uh, the, the, Some people believe that the Russians are, uh, are looking to this notion of a grand solar minimum and thinking they're gonna to have to have that just to feed their people. So uh, there's a lot of different things on the table here and, and different uh, ideas for why, why it's going down the way it is. But uh, if it's truly just a power grab, I don't know that we can be conflicted. Maybe they, they, this whole thing, and it's been suggested that the terms that were put to NATO were, were, were intentionally unacceptable to NATO. And all this was just to make NATO look bad so they could go ahead and move in. In that context, what can we really do? Well, I, I think that it's a little bit of both. So I think um, I think it is a sincere proposal. It's something that uh, Putin has been um, asking us to do since 2007 in, in one form or another. Uh, but it's also something that I think he, he understood that uh, the U.S. would reject. And so in that sense, it's, it's, it serves a dual purpose. It's a pretext for war, but it is something that I think if we were to accept it, then Russia wouldn't attack us and we wouldn't have a war between Russia and the US and we would have some kind of um, you know, conflict resolution in Ukraine as well, an agreed upon negotiated settlement, which I think is what everyone, everyone wants. We wanna, I mean, um, what Biden, the Biden administration keeps saying is we can't allow Russia to invade Ukraine. Well, there's no military solution to, to, from the US standpoint to prevent that, right? Because- Yeah, how do we, how do we not allow that? that? He's explicitly stated he will not send U.S. troops to fight a war um, with Russia in Ukraine. So there is no chance for Ukraine to resist a Russian invasion successfully. It would be a fait accompli if, if Russia goes into Ukraine, Ukraine will lose. So the, the real, I think the, the real thing we need to try is uh, the diplomatic route, because that's the only way we can prevent 
a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Okay. Now, all that said, do you think Russia can hold Ukraine if they get enough jab? If the Ukrainians get enough javelins and things like that, do you think the Russia can actually hold Ukraine? I do. I've been. Can, can they hold it? Yeah. So uh, Russia is, uh, they're massing troops um, in Belarus. So uh, during the um, September Zapad 2021, uh, mil military exercises they had with uh, jointly with Belarus, they brought in uh, 25 trains of military trains worth of equipment and troops. Um, this time they're bringing in 230 trains of equipment. So it's, that's over nine times as much heavy, heavy equi military equipment and troops. I don't think it's nine times as many troops, but it's nine times more trains, obviously. So 230 trains, there's no way with C-17s flying stuff into uh, Ukraine that we can match that. Right. Uh, there's so no way that we can put that much stuff on the ground. I've got, I've got a friend who thinks that we need to go into Ukraine and put stuff, he's got quite a bit of background too, but he thinks we'll go in there and just put our, uh, F-35s and our, our boys on the ground in Ukraine. And, and he thinks that would deter Russia, but there's no way we can, it might, uh, so they wouldn't get in a direct conflict with us. But I don't see no way that if, if he's determined to roll in, that, that, that we can match what they're putting out there. Yeah, and, and the reason this is important, and, and by my estimates, the, the total Russian troops massed there will be 50,000 troops once their mobilization is complete. It's because that uh, Belarus border is very closely on the Ukrainian capital of, of Kiev. Let, 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 let's, let, yeah, I, I'm with you here. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about it from Belarus. So I just want everybody to understand. You're talking about from Belarus, but there's already like 127,000 on the border with Russia to Ukraine. So so this is an addition, okay. I take it. What do you think their total force structure would be uh, around Ukraine uh, when they get this completed? So the minimum number of uh, troops that Russia will have massed, according to U.S. intelligence, is, is going to be 175,000 troops. I think it'll be well in excess of that. Um, I heard from uh, Chris Stewart, a um, member of US, U.S. Congress from Utah, who serves as a senior member of the House Intel Committee, that the number of troops is far in excess of what's being reported by the media. And the, the commonly accepted media uh, number has been in, in the range of 100,000, 127,000 troops. Why would so, they ever report it? What's that? Why would the media underreport this? They don't have access. They don't have access to U.S. You know, top secret U.S. intelligence like like he does, the House Intel Committee. Um, so, in answer to your question, yes, I believe that uh, Russia will. It doesn't currently have enough troops to, to invade and occupy all of Ukraine, but uh, it will within the next few weeks. Um, okay. The most dangerous window, the most likely window for them to invade would be after the Beijing Olympics. Um, and it would be at the end of their uh, scheduled um, Allied Resolve joint military exercises with Belarus, uh, which is which are due to complete on February 20th. Right. So that's, that's the most likely timing of an invasion. Um, it's not inevitable, but it's, it's increasingly becoming inevitable by the uh, foolish um, actions of the Biden administration. Okay, so what we're putting out here, what you're putting out is a, a glimmer of a hope of a way to prevent it by taking away the pretext for war, just to be clear. Right. Even if Putin really wants it. If you take away his pretext, it's going to be harder for him to justify it, perhaps, possibly, unless he just goes for broke anyway. That's always a possibility that, you know, he would do it no matter what. Um, because, yeah, and, and I, 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 didn't, I did not play up that sufficiently. Yeah, it's true they want to rebuild the Russian empire if they can, more or less. Uh, but, you know, that requires also that they subjugate peoples that do not want to be subjugated, just as China does today. Um, which, you know, uh, we, we, we rightfully don't accept that as a, a hope, uh, as a compromise. And I also do think that Russia needs to, you know, if we're going to make concessions, they got to make equal concessions. And that, that's, that's got to be a part of it. That's how negotiations are done. Um, we're not negotiating from a position of strength like we ought to be in, though. Uh, we're moving. And the other thing is we are actually doing the opposite of what Russia asked for. You know, what Russia is asking is for us to pull the stuff out of uh, the Eastern Bloc countries. And we're actually moving things in there right now. Which, yeah. 
how do you see that? If that I've understood from you in the past is you see that as a pathway to conflict with Russia. So Russia rolls into Ukraine. Let's say that NATO doesn't uh, put American troops in there. Some of our troops are in command of NATO instead of our, ourselves. Let's say that we don't put anybody into Ukraine. Russians roll in and take it. Uh, but as a response, we are uh, shoring up our uh, Eastern Bloc allies that are, that are in NATO. How do you see that leading to conflict with Russia? So uh, there have been a number of threats that I addressed in my latest article. And um, you know, some of those threats include economic sanctions, personal economic sanctions against President, Russian President Putin. Uh, they include other, you know, the cutoff of Russia's uh, swift access, which would uh, prevent them from doing bank transactions in dollars. Uh, that would hurt, hurt their economy to a limited extent only, uh, not to the extent that uh, um, U.S. leaders believe, because they've, they have this, uh, you know, this economic agreement with China uh, that China will provide all of their needs in the event of any conflict uh, with, uh, with the U.S. Um, there's also the threat um, you know, of, um, we've actually threatened to, to fund and arm um, a Ukrainian insurgency if the Russians were to, to conquer Ukraine. Uh, and that's very provocative, you know, I mean, because that's a long-term war. Uh, we've also offered to provide uh, offensive arms. Uh, Secretary um, Anthony Blinken is, has uh, suggested that, that we may very well provide offensive arms. Um, and you can only imagine what those would be. I mean, we don't really have a lot of offensive missiles. I, I suppose we could provide uh, cruise missiles. We could provide anti-ship missiles. We could provide main battle tanks. Who are, given, who, are, who are we giving? Who are we giving these weapons to if Ukraine's been taken over? They got a counterinsurgency. How, how do you move in? I can see stingers, but how do you move in a, a cruise missile and give it to a bunch of rebel forces? I, that's a little harder to do. Well, I kind of, I kind of skipped skipped the order, right? Because uh, <laughs> okay. obviously, uh, you know, they they would be providing those arms in advance of a Russian um, complete takeover of Ukraine. It would be. Uh, once once the invasion was in progress, then we would provide those arms. But my contention is that Russia could defeat Ukraine within 30 days. I mean, I don't think it take uh, them that long. So I think I was thinking a lot faster. Yeah, I mean, in terms of causing the collapse to the Ukrainian government, I think it could be 10 to 14 days because uh, you know they're going to position enough troops to to capture uh, Kiev uh, as well as to overthrow the government and install their own puppet government. That could be two weeks um, in terms of a, a full scale invasion occupation of Ukraine, which may or may not be intended. Um, and that could take um, take a month, perhaps. Well, they won't want to wait too long because they want to move when uh, the soil is still frozen so they can get all that heavy equipment across there. Some people yeah. are thinking that uh, that starts melting in February, but I don't. It seems to me that uh, March is more likely a concern month that they would want to be in place and have all this done by March. So if, if they start the invasion on the 20th of February, that really puts them in a tight spot to do that. Right, because the spring thaw usually occurs in late March. So that would give them a window of perhaps uh, five, maybe six weeks max in order to uh, complete their you know, armored thrusts and, and uh, mechanized takeover of, of Ukraine in advance of the spring thaw that would transform uh, Ukraine's uh, roads to mud. When do you so, think we could actually start the advance? At uh, 21st of February, what, what would be your projected? If you just had to guess, if you put yourself in Putin's shoes, not saying that's what he will do, no, Lord only knows what he's really gonna do. But if you were in Putin's shoes and you decided you wanted to do this and he was gonna do it no matter what, what, what date would you be picking? So I would think February 20th because uh, it's a 10 day military exercise. And the idea is to seamlessly seamlessly go from a military exercise to an actual invasion. And that's, that's where you get the element of surprise because it's uh, very difficult, you know, when, when troops are exercising it, they're, they're, uh, it's a battlefield um, exercise for war. So um, that would be the, the easiest uh, way for them to achieve uh, a certain level of operational su uh, surprise um, is if they were to, to transition directly from the exercises to, uh, to a full-scale invasion. Um, it's not clear if, if Belarusian forces will be um, involved in the conflict, but uh, certainly um, Russia has a great advantage by having Belarus as an ally and being able to, to stage Russian invasion troops 
um, into Ukraine because they can um, essentially invade Ukraine from three different directions. They, they can invade from Russia proper in the east, in the Donbass and uh, other eastern, uh, predominantly Russian-speaking re regions. They can invade from Crimea and uh, make thrusts, uh, armored and amphibious thrusts to Odessa, which is uh, Ukraine's last remaining important port, uh, thus cutting off uh, Ukraine from the sea. And then they can also, most importantly, invade from Belarus south uh, to capture, uh, capture Kyiv and uh, essentially you know, win the war in a matter of two weeks. Obviously, there'll be mop-up operations and uh, limited resistance. It'd be almost inevitable. But I think um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and that's one of the key elements of my latest article that was published early this week in, in the National Interest and is still in the top three most read articles, is that uh, they would likely uh, employ a massive cyber attack against Ukraine in advance of their invasion. And if they were really smart, uh, they would, they would uh, stage that attack, they would deny culpability, and they would wait um, about you know, four weeks, three to four weeks uh, for the Ukrainian state to collapse. The government would collapse with a, you know, with this massive cyber attack, uh, you know, our executive director, Peter Price said, a cyber attack could take out 80% of the grid. Uh, so you would assume that actually the Ukrainian grid is probably even more vulnerable because it uses a lot of Russian equipment, right? Um, a lot of their, you know, their equipment and, and their, even their, um, their GPS equivalent, uh, I think it's the GOAT. Uh, Osmaz or whatever it's called. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's uh, uses Russian um, Russian system as well. So they have a greater vulnerability than even I think we do uh, in a, in many areas. And if that were to occur, there you know there'd be a, a breakdown of law and order. Um, the Ukrainian army would likely melt away, um, you know, and head home to their to try to defend their families, uh, you know, provide uh, food and water for their families and and protection against you know roving gains and whatnot. Um, so I think it would create, um, uh, certainly, you know, if, if Ukrainians blamed Russia, there would be a lot of hatred against Russia, but at the same time, I think they would most, most of all, they would yearn for the restoration of law and order that, uh, you know, Russians, obviously, once they, they came in and, and turned on, uh, you know, they, uh, installed a proxy, a proxy or puppet government, they would turn the, turn the lights back on. They would, you know, restore uh, you know, gas, gasoline services, heating services, uh, the food distribution system to any area that they controlled. And then it almost be like they, they didn't control, they could, they could starve them out. Yeah. So they'd be coming in as the saviors, the liberators. That's right. And that's what, that's what Putin's really said that he, he's, uh, he believes that they would do. And but so they, 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 they don't have time to do it. how they have time to do that right, unless they put the cyber attack on like right now. If they're going to roll the twentieth of uh, February, yeah, I they mean, I think a, they can't delay a lot past that for for rolling, and expect to actually roll. So right. they already have done some limited cyber attack. So the high, idea they would do a cyber attack is not off the table. They've already done it, and yeah. and and we, they've done it in the past too, when in the previous uh, Ukrainian war and, and other places. So this is part of their modus operandi, and that's what Americans need to understand. That's also their modus operandi for dealing with us. Right. And, uh, I, I've seen where a lot of people say, well, there's three places that can never be invaded. And one of them was Russia. Well, four, one was Russia and one was China and one was uh, India and the other was the United States. But if you take down, our, you know, th th that did not, those analysis did not take into account what would happen after the power grid got taken out. Right. And that can dramatically change the scenario in any of those areas. And, but but Russia and China have hardened their power grid, so 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 much for that. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's so important to harden our own power grid. And bingo, and why, why our our leaders are so derelict in their duty that we haven't done so after they, you know yeah. being aware of the EMP threat since uh, Starfish the Starfish Prime test in 1963. You know, I chaired my first power grid defense conference six years ago, and I've been active in the power grid defense realm since before then. So, you know, it's, it was clear to me that we've got to do something and we've been pushing this and Dr. Pry has been pushing this for decades now and they've identified the problems, the issues, the ways to fix it. 
and it, it's just uh, like trying to pour molasses uphill. We're having a lot of trouble due to the uh, uh, systems in our government that are in bed with the power industries and their reluctance to spend a dollar or two. Uh, but we uh, we got a lot of potential solutions for this, but we just, people got to come together and work for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to mention that, um, you know, the Biden administration has been reviewing plans to um, to at least double the number of our troops in Eastern Europe uh, and the Baltics, and perhaps even um, increase them by a factor of 10 uh, to 55,000, from 5,000 to 55,000, 11 times higher. And I think that would really, especially if they were deployed to the Baltics, which uh, Putin is especially sensitive about, you know, would be the, doing the exact opposite of what, what uh, Putin asked, asked us to do in his in uh, his proposed security agreement, it would basically be sticking another finger in his eye and daring him to come attack us, which I think he would. So uh, for me, that's that's probably the, the greatest danger. Um, but you see this, you see this is what would lead to the war. This is what you said, I think in our first interview, was our conventional force buildup in Eastern Bloc countries would lead to a conflict with Russia. Well, he's, they've taken it to the next level. They're talking about putting stuff in Venezuela and in Cuba. And we right. had a missile crisis once upon a time. That was the last time that we had things at, at this level. Uh, so that that could take us back to something like that. You know, we, we narrowly, narrowly escaped nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there was the, the uh, Russian submarine that we were trying to get to surface with depth charges that thought we were trying to destroy it. The commander ordered uh, his uh, uh, torpedo uh, a crew to actually launch a nuclear torpedo on the American warship, and one guy refused. One guy, and he was he was blackballed for the rest of his life. Or that guy, and I, I'd have to look it up. I don't remember his name right now. Yeah, he should be a global hero. He saved us from a nuclear war back in 1962. Yeah, one of the political commissars, if I'm not mistaken. Right, and I, I and I even heard it was a second incident in that uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, similar to that. There were a couple of different individuals, but there was one in particular that's noted for that. So we came very close. And we've had a lot of other close calls since then with Russia. Uh, I'm concerned with all these hypersonic missiles that we don't have the warning time we used to. A lot of the, some of these scenarios where we figured out it wasn't a real attack was because we knew it took so long for the missiles to come over the poles and we figured out the attack was not real. When you start narrowing that window of warning time, like some of the modern weapon systems, that you lose that advantage. So I think the prospects for, for if we don't come up with some means for peace, we're in a dire strait for a, a war, especially if uh, there's all the, 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 the tit for tat, like we put troops there and they put troops in Venezuela and Cuba. Right. Uh, we got to find some way to deconflict this, but there is another hope. And here it is. Uh, if we can find some way to avoid war now with Russia, and even with China, if we can find whatever means we can find to, to avoid war for 10, 20, especially 20 years, uh, these countries are aging, their weapon systems will be wearing out. They'll find themselves unable to maintain, continue to maintain them economically because they're gonna be under a lot of economic pressure. The, the uh, demographics of the countries are changing so much. I don't see them being able to uh, maintain the aggressive posture to do things like take Taiwan if it's not already happened. If they don't take it in the next 10 to 20 years, I think they're, 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 they, uh, they're gonna lose their ability to do that. They may do it just because they see that. And this may be why Russia's pushing right now. This is probably Putin's last best chance uh, due to his own demographics, his economy, his age, and the fact that he's got a weak president in the United States to face. I think he's looking at this as his last best chance to build his empire. Uh, but if we can hold it off, there's hope that we may actually uh, attain a lot better uh, days ahead. What do you think? Well, so Peter and I kind of um, have a different viewpoint. And our viewpoint is um, you don't need to have a massive economy to, 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 to be a nuclear great power. I mean, look at North Korea, one of the poorest countries in the world has uh, a first-class nuclear arsenal. They're testing hypersonic weapons that we don't even have. They have, uh, I think, about four to five classes of ICBMs. We have one. Um, obviously, we have way more nuclear weapons than they do overall. Um, but And they've been able to do this, obviously, with uh, you know 
large-scale Chinese economic and military technical assistance. Well, they're, they're a Spartan uh, society in North Korea, and, and it, it's all war, just like the Spartans in Greece. Yeah, it, but, 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 that's, that's nuclear forces, strategic forces. They're, they're, I don't know that they can maintain con, uh, a conventional force of, of a quality enough to, to make the kind of invasions that they're dreaming about. Uh, it, well, I mean, I, mean they're, I think they're focused like a laser on retaking South Korea, and they certainly have the capabilities to do it. They have the um, right now. Um, second or third largest uh, nerve gas arsenal in the world. They have the fourth largest army in the world with over a, a million men, including 100,000 uh, special purpose force forces that are essentially, you know, special forces commandos like, uh, you know, Russian Spetsnaz. Um, so... They do have a lot of capabilities, so I, I do think Russian, uh, Russia and Chinese threat, um, you know, it's all relative, right? Because the U.S. nuclear arsenal is, has decayed, you know, it's like 30 to 50 years old. Uh, we have B-52s, they were first flown in, I think, uh, the, the late 1950s. Obviously not, you know, we produced them beyond that. Yeah, they're um, older than me. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, the Minuteman III uh, came into service the year after I was born, so um, that's not a good thing. Uh, Russia and China, all of their nuclear weapons are, you know, uh, been built in the last 20 years. Um, you know, the warheads, this is the interesting thing for your listeners. You know, we're talking about modernizing, you know, the, the, the greatest super hawks on the, on the Republican side. They, they don't talk about adding a single strategic nuclear warhead to our arsenal to match Russia's or China's, which may be five to six times larger uh, within the next, uh, by the end of the decade. But they talk about, you know, modernizing our arsenal with uh, with new missiles to replace the old ones that we have, and that's that's a good thing. Um, but the interesting thing is with the, uh, uh, you know, the ground-based strategic uh, deterrent that would replace our Minuteman three ICBMs uh, would use Peacekeeper um, old MX warheads that were built in the 80s. So we would, you know, we would be deploying warheads again that are, are 40 to 50 years old on brand new missiles. So, um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's a really bad idea, you know, to keep uh, our nu nuclear missiles and warheads well beyond their intended service life, uh, because there is the risk that they, they will not function. They'll, they'll be unreliable if and when they're ever called to, uh, um, you know, to, to be used to uh, retaliate against an, an enemy attack. Yeah, for, the, for those that are watching uh, you for the first time, they may not know that the part of the ad the thing that one of the things that you and Peter Pry both uh, advocate is that we do build back our strategic arsenal of nuclear weapons, that we get on par with our adversaries. And we can't just get on par with Russia. We're facing both Russia and China that we need to uh, come up to some higher level as a credible deterrent to keep them from thinking they can wipe us out and take everything. Uh, but that also includes we need to uh, harden our power grid. That's a critical strategic step that needs to be made so that we don't get uh, blasted and perhaps even conquered in some fashion. So uh, these are all important things. And uh, hey, I, I, I'd say that our, our, our amendment number five, if you know what I mean, those factors in that too, because we might need something behind the grass blades in America should it, things get worse, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. And we so also have that. the same people that are putting our troops out there want to take that away from us, even after they, they, they supplied uh, potential uh, potential people that aren't so friendly to us with so much stuff in Afghanistan. Yeah, we also need to build back, you know, we need to build a, um, a massive national missile defense arsenal to defend our nation against nuclear missile attack. Um, that could also help defend us against DMP attack potentially, other than, you know, satellites. Obviously, uh, North Korea reportedly has a couple of super EMP satellites they could use to take down our grid. Um, but that, I think that's, uh, that's a really important thing to do. Uh, Russia has, um, by my estimation, over 5,000 ABMs. Uh, they had 8,500 um, as of, of the last report uh, wow. back in Way beyond. 87. Way beyond many now, but uh, the ones they're building are increasingly capable. They replace, they're replacing their S-300s with S-400 ABMs. Uh, now their S-500 is uh, scheduled to come, become operational later this year. Uh, the S-500 has tremendous range and capabilities, many times in excess of, of, our, of our ABMs. So uh, I think we should deploy about 5,000 ABMs um, on our cruisers and destroyers. 
Um, sadly, I read just uh, earlier this week or last week that uh, the plan is to get rid of uh, two thirds of our um, eight Aegis cruisers. So the very platforms that could defend our nation against nuclear missile attack, the Navy wants to retire. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's like amazing. on the road with class cruisers. Wow. Just to age out. Wow. Yeah, you got to wonder about some of the brass in charge of our military today, especially uh, the likes of General Mark Milley. Yeah. Uh, and, and our and Austin, who's the who's the Secretary of Defense. Uh, yeah, I really questioned those guys quite a bit. Um, in fact, I got a little nickname for Mark Milley. I call him Milley Vanilli. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably too young to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, all right, we're, 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 we're coming a little past an hour here. So, uh, let, let's kind of tighten this up. What one, I'd like to see what you think is most likely to happen and what you think, uh, we could do about it just just to recapitulate you know your military uh when i was in the military they we were taught to tell people what you're going to tell them tell them and then tell them what you told them recapitulation so let's kind of recapitulate here uh bottom line what do you think uh, what do you think actually is most likely to happen let's let's hear that part so i I think um most likely we will see a a russian invasion of ukraine um in the late february time frame um, that will be preceded by a, a massive cyber attack that will um, cause result in Ukraine's collapse, both uh, essentially militarily and uh, as well as their government. Uh, Russia will go in, they'll take capture the Ukrainian capital and re, uh, replace the government with the puppet government, uh, which uh, uh, will sign an agreement with Russia to allow Russian troops to remain indefinitely in the country. Um, I think uh, Biden will likely respond by sending uh, thousands of troops, perhaps even tens of thousands, uh, to Eastern Europe to uh, kind of, I guess, send a signal to to Putin that you know, we're going to be we're going to be tough, right? But um, uh, depending on the, the the number of troops and their positioning, uh, that could be kind of the you know crossing the red line that that causes Putin to attack us. I'm hoping that doesn't you know that doesn't happen and ho- hoping that um, I think I, I do think that uh, President Biden ha- has um, the closer we've come to uh, to war with Russia over Ukraine, I think the more realistic he's been behind the scenes. Um, you don't see that in terms of uh, their uh, the Biden administration's public pronunciations, which have been almost entirely negative and adverse to our national security. Uh, but uh, some of the conversations I've seen reported, certainly with, by CNN with uh, the Ukrainian president have been uh, much more positive. And he's essentially said, we're not gonna give you any major arms. If, if you get invaded, you're gonna be mostly on your own. Uh, so you need to prepare for that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's encouraging. Um, so maybe, maybe Biden wouldn't support an insurgency. Um, so that would be one less thing to provoke Russia. I don't think he would he would actually send offensive arms. The problem is we're making all these threats that are red flag, you know, crossing red lines for uh, for Russia, and you know we don't want them to provoke to to attack us over things we don't in, actually end up doing. And that's kind of the, the the situation we're facing with China over Taiwan as well, because. You know, here we have a president who was elected with uh, Chinese electoral interference, and he's he's talking about the need to that no, we we actually are going to defend Taiwan against the Chinese invasion, and then his his administration officials have to walk that back. Um, I think China is a lot more paranoid than than Russia is. I mean, they're they kind of uh, you know they don't take chances. I think Russia would be wouldn't start with a, an EMP attack. They would. Kind of see how the situation developed in Ukraine, how we reacted, and then they would react to what to what we do. China may re, you know may react to what we say, and that's the biggest risk of all. I think is is if China um, concludes that well, you know, we thought Biden was our friend, but he's making these statements that he's going to fight us if we try to reunite our country. That's that's from their standpoint um, in, in invading Taiwan. Um, hopefully, they they know Biden better and. and they have intelligence that he doesn't actually mean what he says. Um, that would be a, a much better. It wouldn't take a lot of digging to find that out. So, yeah. 
<laughs> let's let's let, let me ask you a question. What do you think the probability, just given the way the leaders are heading today, if they don't make some other change, or maybe you should factor in the possibility, Will, what do you actually think the probability of war with Russia is right now? American war, not, not the one in Ukraine. What do you think the probability of the United States and Russia having a war, NATO and Russia, if NATO gets into it, we get into it. If a NATO country does something Russia don't like and they attack a NATO country, we're in it. So what do you think the probability is that we're going to have a war with Russia? I think if the Biden administration falls through on its threats, uh, the chances are about 80 percent that we'll have a war with Russia. I think if they if they don't follow through, then the chances are, are maybe perhaps in the 50 percent or, or below range, um, as little as 30 percent. If they were if they were to not deploy troops to Eastern Europe, if they were to behind the scenes tell tell Russia provide some kind of guarantee that Ukraine will never join. NATO, uh, or they'll they'll accept as a fait accompli a, a Russian invasion and take over of Ukraine, or, or simply a puppet government that, with promises of an eventual Russian military withdrawal. Um, I think if they were to do all those type of things, then I think the chances are very are quite good that we could avoid war with Russia. Obviously, um, you know the the best approach would be to come to these agreements before an invasion. But as I wrote in my article. Um, it's even more important still to not overreact to Russian invasion and keep the diplomatic channels open, um, to not respond militarily, to not send troops uh, to Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, that's really the key. That's the key to, to preventing war, is that we respond diplomatically to an invasion and with ideally no economic sanctions at all and, um, and, and not respond militarily. Uh, so you put out there what you see the risk is. You put out what you see the solution is. Uh, what do you now? It's in their doctrine to EMP us, one way or another. If we right. have do you think if we have a theater war? By that, for those that are listening, now I mean a war that's contained within Europe. Do you think that if we can contain it in Europe, keep it conventional? That Russia, you don't think we can keep it conventional? I think there's a zero percent chance that a, a war with Russia in Eastern Europe could be containable, or that it would remain conventional. Um, okay. Then, then what you're Europe. saying is we've got it right now by the eighty percent chance that the United States gets nuked, gets EMP'd, all those kind of things. Well, and to us and Americans, an EMP is going to be devastating. It's going to be at least eighty percent of us gone in a year. Guys, this is a start prediction. This is very stark. Wow. This is why I tell you to prep. This is why we have these eyes wide open and head on a swivel uh, series of videos. This is real. It's a real threat. Uh, we're not fear mongering. We're on here actually hope mongering. We're trying to find a way through this. So this is hope mongering. <laughs> but uh, th this is, you know, this is a uh, considerable threat. That even if the estimates are way off and if things go well, do you want to play Russian roulette with the Russians? Uh, even if it, we got it down to 20%, that's still not putting a revolver to your head with a round and spinning the chamber and snapping the, the uh, trigger. What do you want? You know, th this we are in a dangerous situation any way we, we go here. Uh, in a war, even if, if it were just in Ukraine, it's going to have huge global consequences on our supply chain, our economy. Uh, but uh, it don't look like there's much chance that it uh, would be contained within Ukraine. It looks like we're going to respond or NATO's going to respond or somebody is in such a way that's, that would keep this thing escalating. Yeah, uh, I, th I think if, if we were to follow my recommendations and pursue peaceful diplomatic options, I think we could reduce it to a 0% chance of war with Russia. Uh, but the, the much greater threat, uh, you know, that, that's a lot more difficult uh, would be a th the threat of war with China. Yeah, and we that, still got to deal with China after this. We still got to deal with yeah. China, North Korea. North Korea could EMP us, which, which would also take out our economy, guys. It would take us down to that 80%. Uh, uh, you know, to me, a, an EMP attack is as bad as a nuclear attack, full-blown nuclear attack. Uh, maybe worse. Uh, <laughs> the uh, So a lot of people don't really get how bad that can be. And I've covered that on some of my videos. And I say it's worse than you can imagine. A lot of people will go, well, hey, it'd be great. I wouldn't have to deal with all the TV and commercials and the kids wouldn't be on their computers and phones and society got to get more back to normal. No, it's going to be a catastrophic 
a scenario beyond your imagination how bad that's going to be. And I've, I've covered that before. If you don't believe that, go back and check my other videos on this, guys, for, for those of you watching. Uh, this is this we're, we're in a serious situation, guys. This is this is not good by any stretch of the imagination. How soon do you think we might if well, I'm going to ask another question, then we're going to go back to the hope side. How soon do you think that after uh, Russia rolls into Ukraine, which would be at the end of February going through March, how long do you think it would take before we actually got engaged in the war with Ukraine? Just roughly, what do you think? Well, I mean, just yeah, just to, just to clarify, I, I don't believe we would get involved in Ukraine itself. No, but no, I, I think the war would, Yeah, if we respond militarily, uh, when I say militarily, we move large masses of U.S. troops um, and and heavy heavy tanks, aircraft, uh, a, a lot of the things that the Biden administration has been talking about as uh, potential options, um, you know, to to what they refer to as NATO's eastern flank. Um, then I think um, I think it could could happen as early as as late March. I mean, mid to late March. We could be in, we could be at war with Russia in late March. How, what would you see as the outside? March till well, June. So there, there is a chance. So there is a chance. Um, so I've been reading. You know, a good military analyst always doesn't just read. Uh, Read the article, you know, the articles and the and the and the th thinking that that they believe. They also study, all, you know, counter countervailing opinions. Amen. Amen. And I amen. and I read one today that made a credible case that maybe Putin's bluffing, um, that he'll only invade if if um, you know he, he's not given a face saving way out, um, but that you know there's certain things that Russia hasn't done. They haven't propagandized their people to to prepare them for war. They haven't called uh, Ukrainian government a bunch of Nazis like they did last time in 2014. Uh, just certain things like that, uh, that that give me, you know, some hope that you know it it's certainly possible um, that Russia could delay its Ukraine or its invasion of Ukraine well beyond March into into the summer months or even fall. Um, so, you know, I don't want to say that it's it's definitely going to happen in March, but if I if I was asked to predict a time that we would uh, face face war with Russia and China, I would say um, as early as mid to late March, um, but um, likely by April, but not not um, with certainty. Well, of course, uh, once we start getting into the spring season, it's a lot easier for uh, China to invade Taiwan. Right. Under the cover, these stresses take advantage of that, and they might begin an aerial rocket attack even before then. You know, they'd want to soften it up before they go in. They got to have good sea states to get in there, so they can't really roll at the same time. What's Russia's advantage to roll is when the ground is solid, which is winter. Uh, China needs to wait a little bit longer before they could actually stage an invasion fleets, landing craft into Taiwan, but they could start hitting them with rockets and. Uh, you know, so what, what typically a uh, power will do before they go in is they try to soften the target up as the yeah. uh, terminology is used, hitting them with, you know, artillery, rockets, uh, whatever. The yeah, planes, cyber attacks. Yeah, let's start with cyber attacks, of course. Right. So uh, the, the, these are all, and it might be, they might just do a cyber attack and stand off. I mean, if somebody wanted to invade the United States, they'd do a cyber attack and stand off for a year. Uh, we, you know, would be a, a lot worse position here. Of course, the ones that survive might be really mean. <laughs> they might have a hard time. I guess the, yeah. the people that have managed to survive that for a year is going to be, they're going to be tough to deal with. Uh, so I don't know. We, we, I think it would make uh, going into Afghanistan look like a cakewalk coming to America a year after. That's just my opinion. Unless the Biden administration gets their way and takes away certain means we have of protecting ourselves, if you know what I mean. Uh, of course, they want to take that away from us too. Really? Wow. Uh, all right, so we, we've painted a grim picture here. Let's talk just one more time the way out. What can people do right now to give us a chance for getting out of this? What would you recommend to the viewer to do? So for the viewers, I, I would ask, ask uh, all of your viewers to uh, go to emptaskforce.us, and there you'll find a number of resources. Uh, you can donate to our organization. We can um, get our message out more effectively uh, as a private um, organization to a nonprofit to, um, you know, with additional funding. 
You can download uh, and, and buy books by our executive director, Dr. Peter Pry. He's got by far the, the, the best published and, and um, the most respected as, a, as our most brilliant uh, uh, strategic mind. And then um, I also have an EMP task force report uh, that I published on what America needs to do to ensure its national survival. And that's available um, on our, our website as well. And then um, also uh, I encourage you, or, uh, your listeners to go to um, do a search for uh, David T. Pine, um, the national interest, and you'll, you'll find my archive of articles and um, to send, send my most recent articles on how to, how to win the peace. Um, as well as Dr. Price articles and um, and uh, our latest CMP task force report to your uh, members of Congress and urge them to um, you know to go public you know publicly uh, campaign for peace and peace with with Russia and China and, and talk about what American first um, national security policy really look looks like. Uh, the last I checked it um, in their co constitutional oaths of office it doesn't say anything about defending other countries. It doesn't say anything about fighting other countries' wars. It talks about protecting, preserving, and defending the United States of America. And that's what our founding fathers um, advocated. They, they warned us against entangling alliances. Uh, President uh, John Quincy Adams uh, warned us not to uh, go in search of monsters to destroy like Russia and China when they're half a world away. Obviously, if they're in our hemisphere, then we, then we have to fight them with everything we have. Um, no doctrine. Uh, yeah. So that, that, that I think is the key. And, uh, if I could, if I had my wish, I would like, I'd love to see president Trump, you know, talk about, uh, an America first national security policy as applied to Russia and China and, and say that it's not in our interest to fight, fight a war with Russia in Eastern Europe or a, a war with China in Taiwan. And, uh, I think that mobilize, uh, a heat, you know, tens of millions of Americans behind him. And in uh, supporting. All right, so so give us your give us the task force website again. Say it, say it real clearly, slowly, so people. Sure. Can, I'll put a link in the, the video chat notes too. Yeah, it's www.emptaskforce.us, and then uh, the national interest website is uh, www.nationalinterest.org, where you can find my latest articles. And uh, it, th this is one of the books that you might get at the uh, task force. This one I had from Dr. Pry, and uh, it, it, he's one of many. This is not his most recent one, but this one's got letters you can write to Congress uh, for getting into your state legislators, governors to get the grid hardened. It's got it's that kind of advice here in the back of it. It paints a picture for the threat on the grid. This, this one is grid centric. Uh, so now we're facing a, a bigger situation here. Uh, but you can also, if you want to know how to contact your congressman, if you want to know how to find your congressman, or your state legislators, or if you want to know how to track bills in the Congress or the state legislators, go to freedomrestorationfoundation.org and click on the action center and go down in that. So these are, uh, so I'd go to, to the task force and then go to, to get the material, and then go to freedomrestorationfoundation.org to, to get the how to push it through. Also, Mike maybe has uh, a, a lot of good assets on his website, contacts and data. You can find that in the videos I did with Mike Maybe. Just go to my video, go to my videos and search on it with a little hourglass for Mike Maybe. Uh, we got a lot of resources out there, people, we can use. I say, as long as we got hope, don't ever give up. As long as there's hope, don't surrender, don't give up. We still got a chance to get through this, but this is bleak. The prospects of what are in front of us are frightening. It's bleak. And uh, but don't lose your humanity over it. Don't panic. If you panic, you're going to be you're going to be in trouble. Keep your wits about you. Prepare. Get ready. Prepare. Get, right now, you need to, the other thing you need to be doing is stocking up. I mean, uh, if if everything we say here don't come to pass, we still got so many problems with our global uh, food chain, with uh, with uh, things that Mother Nature could bring on us with the sun, which can take down our power grid. Uh, you would be way and just inflation right now and buying foods and investment. Uh, Guys, you know, I bought this can a couple of years ago. It's already, it's already appreciated faster than Bitcoin or, or, <laughs> or <laughs> a lot of your precious metals. And, you know, you can't eat your precious metals. So consider, uh, you know, that might be still wor worth investing in. I'm not here to give you investment advice in general. 
but you know you can eat food, uh, but you know you also might need to be able to hide some of it. That's why I promote the, the stuff I promote. That stuff's a lot easier to hide and bury in the ground or carry with you if you have to bug out or go on maneuvers. So uh, consider all these things, guys. We're talking about an ugly situation. I got to get some, I'll get some survivalists on here talking about what we may be facing uh, in a grid down situation, the kind of things you may have to do to survive. We got some of that with Stacy Zavicki already. We'll, we'll look more into that in f future videos. But we're going to keep also along the way, every chance we can, I'll, I'll bring back people like uh, David Pine, Peter Pry, Dr. Pry, to talk, and others to talk about what we can do to try to avert these things from happening in the first place. As long as we got a chance, we got to work that. The best pre prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth a gallon of cure because the cure side, you're in an ugly universe when that comes. It's ugly. We don't want to be there if we can avoid it. But I say get, stay right with your maker. Get right with your maker. Make sure your family members know you will love them. And start building your personal alliances, your personal survival tribes, your networks. You may need them. If nothing else, you made friends. And there's nothing wrong with, uh, with letting your family people know that you love them. You should always do that anyway. But right now, it's time to double down on that. Because we just don't know where we're heading, guys. We're going in uncharted territory here. And it, and it doesn't look pretty at the moment. So by all means, do these things. and. Uh, David, do you get any final word? No, I just want to uh, thank you for having me again on your show. Uh, you, you do a great service to, to your, your listeners and fellow Americans to uh, bring on good guests and, and, you know, you share your, your knowledge of, uh, you know, how to, how to prepare and survive against these types of EMP contingencies and, of course, serve as our state director as well. So thank you again. I, I, I'm all for getting a power grid hardened. I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer. And a survivalist. I work space stuff, and I uh, I'm a prepper and a worm farmer too, <laughs> which is a pretty good prepper business. So, guys, we still have hope. Don't give up yet. Well, don't give up. Always, if you got breath, keep keep pushing forward. So, uh, yeah, David, thank you so much for being here. I hope to get you back soon. If we if we got a world to, and a platform to talk on and power to get the word out, we'll keep doing this. So, everybody, thank you for watching. I wish everybody the best and don't surrender. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Greg out.